Good morning, church. Good to see everyone this morning, and it's a good Lord's Day to worship together today. Uh, if you're new to church this morning, please let us know that you're here. We'd love to uh, just say hello and welcome to our church. Uh, you can fill out a card that's in the pew rack there in front of you. And then also, if, if you have any prayer requests this morning, let us know about those too. Uh, we like to remind you of that often because we want to know what, what's going on in your life and, and be praying together as a church family. Uh, I've got several announcements, uh, this being summer, but uh, I have a lot of things going on. Uh, the first is just a couple weeks now, just over two weeks from now, is VBS. Uh, VBS is July 11th through July 15th, and you can register uh, your kids, you could register yourself as a volunteer, and you could do that even online. The, the details for that are in the bulletin. Uh, it's going to be uh, weekdays in the evenings, and uh, that's how we've uh, been doing it this year. There's a Sanctity of Life VBS that we're doing with Answers in Genesis, and that couldn't be more appropriate uh, after what happened this week. More about that later. Uh, but we also, for VBS, um, we, every year we ask for uh, cookies and treats, and this year we're asking for VBS cookies again. Uh, more details are in the bulletin about uh, providing that, and uh, if, if you'd love to uh, help out with that for the kids, uh, please, uh, please do so. Uh, and then in just a week, just over a week now, there's going to be VBS training, so volunteers who will be serving in VBS. Whether you've done it before or, or this is the first time, certainly uh, plan on coming to that training. It's going to be July 6th at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall, and uh, that, that's just over a week from now. Uh, something else that's just a week away is going to be another round of our Church Essentials classes, our Newcomers classes. Uh, those are going to be starting on July 3rd, Sunday, and they're going to be four Sundays in July, skipping just the 17th, and they'll, they'll be after our evening service, so around 6.15 to around 7.30. And these classes are uh, both for people who want to learn about membership uh, and for those who just want to know more about our church. Uh, but it's also a prerequisite for baptism, and th they lead to a baptism service we'll be doing Sunday, August 7th, the first Sunday in August. So if you'd like to be baptized, uh, you do need to be a part of, of the classes, but in either case, please let me know. You could fill out a card to that effect as well, or you could just uh, talk to me after service. I'd love to have you as a part of these classes or a part of baptisms, and we're looking forward to, to having some good baptisms on the 7th and welcoming some new members into our church family. Uh, a couple other things here. Um, we announced this a few weeks ago, but if, if you are able or would like to provide, help provide a meal to families that are in need, either uh, after surgery or, or just going through a difficult time in life, uh, then there is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby, and uh, you'll see it there on the table as you're leaving to the left. And if, if you would be able to help on a part-time basis here and there, uh, just delivering some meals uh, to people in our church, then you could help out our deaconesses in doing that, and uh, we, we'd love to have you take part in that, that very important ministry in our church. Uh, also, uh, two Sundays from now, we'll be having our quarterly business meeting, so just a little uh, reminder that that is coming up for our church members. And then today, today, the last uh, announcement I have for you is uh, that we're having a family fun day today. This is going to be right after the service. So this is like a, a chat and chew on steroids today. Uh, we're we're going to have lots of great food. Uh, Karen Madrid's making Frito boats. We also have a, a snow cones uh, machine that's going to be out there. There's going to be cotton candy, uh, lots of other little treats, and then a ton of games. Uh, if you walk past the fellowship hall right now, you'll see there's just games strewn about everywhere. And uh, it's just an opportunity for us to kind of get together as a church family, have some fun this summer and do so together. So stick around for that, for some great food, and just for some fun uh, this afternoon. And that'll be right after this service starts. And, you know, you're, if, if the message is kind of boring this morning or something, you're not allowed to go in there early and start playing games. Just... Hold off, wait until the service is over, but that, that's coming up today, and we're, we're going to have a lot of fun with that. Now, I'd like to begin our worship service and, and to do so with a call to worship. This morning, uh, it just so happens that we've been reading basically straight through the Psalms for our calls to worship, and we uh, did chapter 9 last week, 
And today we're in chapter 10. Chapter 10, not a typical call to worship psalm. However, with this decision that was, uh, came down from SCOTUS this past week on Roe v. Wade, uh, I think you'll see that uh, the verses here in chapter 10 are very uh, appropriate uh, and a very appropriate reason to worship the Lord this morning. I'm going to be reading selections of Psalm chapter 10. In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. He sits in ambush in the villages, in hiding places. He murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. The helpless are crushed, sink down and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God is forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Would you pray with me? Lord God, you are our help in times of desperate trouble. You are the savior of our souls. You are the healer of our lives, of our families, of our nation. We come before you a grateful people who know that when they pray to you, they will be heard. When we lift up the name of Jesus Christ through whom we approach you, we have great confidence in our King and our Lord. And it is to him that we sing and worship and desire to hear from this morning. Bless us, we pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, please stand up and greet one another this morning as the worship team prepares to lead us in singing today.
Please remain standing for our scripture reading. This morning we'll be reading Genesis 8 and 9, and we're going to do both as responsive scripture readings. Uh, we'll start in chapter 8, and you follow along with the highlighted text. The word of the Lord. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, 
you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living creature that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, Genesis chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image.
Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both of their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. You may be seated. Thank you. Would you continue worship together with me now in, in prayer this morning? Lord God, we, we thank you for this beautiful day to worship you, to look at a, a cloudless sky and to sing your praise, to take, Lord, this day and every day of our lives as a gracious gift that you have given as a result of this promise you have made, and, Lord, to, to see this day as the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We have a good God, a generous God, a gracious God, God who welcomes us to bring our requests, our prayers, our supplications, our anxieties to him, and to know that we are heard in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we pray together, we want to begin by thanking you for those who serve with us in, in gospel ministry and in declaring your word. We think in our own church of our deacons and deaconesses, and we pray, Lord, that they would continue to have wisdom from on high, uh, compassion from the heart of Christ, and godly leadership in, in a difficult world. We pray, too, for our missionaries. And this week, we think in our denomination of uh, Bernard Emerson and Chris Lovelace, both of whom serve uh, in, and converge PAC West uh, as the president and as the church planting director. We pray that you would lead and guide them, Lord, uh, in the truth of your word, and Lord, in, in much fruitful ministry. We pray too, Lord, for Liam uh, Manholland, who is Ken Gatke's grandson. We've been praying for him. He's been in a uh, five-month YWAM missions trip in Europe. Right now he's in Albania, and he'll be coming home in August. And Lord, we continue to pray for Liam. Thank you that he has this great opportunity, and we pray that you would use him to 
to affect the lives of many, to bring back to us many good stories, Lord, of, of your work. We think too, Lord, of those in the persecuted church around our world that, Lord, are, are suffering, are, are really putting their lives on the line just for doing what we're doing this morning. This morning, we, we think of Pastor Marin, who was arrested back in 2004, and he was part of a, a church in Masawa, and he's being held at a maximum security prison that they're not even really sure if he's there uh, for sure. He, is, he hasn't been given any charges. He's just being detained and held. Lord, would you bless him? Uh, would you give him fruitful ministry even there? Uh, Lord, would you encourage his heart this morning and his family? We thank you too, Lord, for the, the ways that you answer our prayers, the ways that you do so specifically. We know that you always answer our prayer. Sometimes those answers are a no. Sometimes those answers are to wait. But other times those answers are a yes. And we thank you, Lord, um, first of all in our church family for uh, being with Evelyn this week. She had another uh, back procedure for pain and it, it seemed to be effective. It, it seems to be turning the tide. And we pray that would only continue for her. She's just been in debilitating back pain for months, hardly able to sleep well. And we pray that you would bless our sister. We thank you that you have. We pray too for Tim Dutcher, who had uh, a hip surgery this, this past week and is home recovering and is making good progress. And we thank you for success in that surgery. Lord, we thank you perhaps most of all this week for answering our prayers to turn back row. Lord, it has been nearly 50 years of your people praying and uh, protesting and fighting and encouraging and this day has finally come lord you moved in a way that we thought would never really happen in our country and we want to give you grateful praise we know lord that this was this was not the work of one man or even of a whole group of people, certainly of politicians, but this was a move of our God. And we pray, Lord, that you would use this to save countless lives of, of little precious newborn babies. And Lord, that uh, you would empower and encourage your church to take this moment to continue to show the world what it means that we believe life is sacred, sacred from the moment it begins at conception. That reminds us too, Lord, of those that we want to pray for that uh, are enduring passings, the other end of life. We continue to pray for Elaine Wiebe and her family as her brother Glenn passed less than two weeks ago, and then that was right after her husband Vern. We pray, Lord, you would encourage her pray for Rodney Stevens, who just this past week learned that his cousin John Heisner, who was battling with cancer, also uh, passed. And then, Lord, we pray for um, Jelly and Andrew, who are adult step-grandkids of Irene Pitchford, whose estranged father passed away recently after making some attempts to uh, renew those relationships. Lord, we pray to you because you are the giver of life and of eternal life. We pray that these families would be resting with hope in the Savior, Jesus Christ. We also, Lord, want to pray for other needs in our church. We thank you, too, that Brenda Lincoln, uh, she had some CT scans to, to show that she has uh, multiple hernias she's had for years and is waiting, Lord, for what's going to happen next, and we pray you would bless her in that, and that, Lord, it would it would result in healing for her. We pray for Dan and Julie Lyons, who are traveling back from Texas this coming Wednesday, and pray they would have a blessed Sunday with their family there, who just moved to Texas. We pray, too, for Mary Lyra, um, mother-in-law of Rachel Lyra, who just started chemotherapy. Um, we pray for her, and we pray for so many others, Lord, that we know, both in our church and related to our church, that are battling through cancer. Uh, battling through what is uh, a week-by-week, a day-by-day uh, fight. 
Would you give them an unnatural strength? Would you give them uh, great success in the treatments they are undergoing? And Lord, would they lean on their Lord uh, through it all? In light of our prayers this morning for Roe v. Wade, we also want to take to heart your command to us that supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high uh, positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And so, Lord, we pray for our national and state and local authorities. We pray for our politicians. We pray for our government. We pray for this country. We pray, Lord, um, that you would move in hearts so that biblical justice and truth and most of all faith in Christ would reign in this land and that we would see a place where the righteousness of God is displayed and where people are calling out for the righteousness that can only come in perfection, in the Lord of glory, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, at this time, children may be dismissed for our children's uh, classes uh, upstairs, and the uh, leaders will be happy to take them up there. We're going to continue worship, and we're going to do so in the giving of our tithes and offerings. And to prepare us for that, I'd like to read from Psalm chapter 37, verses 23 to 26. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously, and his children become a blessing. May we now worship in the giving of our tithes and offerings together. Now for the message. Lord God, we, we want to hear from you. and We want to honor your word this morning. Bless us, Lord, that we might see it clearly. We might love it from our hearts. And we might walk in it by your spirit. Speak now, Lord. Amen. Laura and I were married uh, 15 years ago this March, and on the day of our wedding, we noticed uh, something we failed to see at the rehearsal the night before. 
uh, a seven-foot rainbow flag was prominently standing in the foyer of the church we were to be married in. Uh, we were a bit shocked and panicked uh, on the morning of our wedding and were scrambling to find a place to, to hide it. Uh, this large, bright, colorful flag. And my mother-in-law, God bless her, ended up uh, putting it behind an open door in the corner. You see, the, the church building that we were using for our wedding was not our church building. At, at the time, we lived in Laura's hometown of Atascadero, and we were members of what was then Berean Bible Fellowship. And Berean Bible Fellowship had a building that was the, the shape of an L. It was more like a, a, a business building. And uh, I thought about making a shirt that said, uh, go to the L and escape hell, but that never happened. <laughs> but a, as a result of that, uh, there was no aisle to walk down. Uh, there was just a corner. And so it was not a suitable building for a church. However, there was a building in town that was very suitable. It was their white steepled church, beautiful church. It was the community church of Atascadero, one that Laura had grown up kind of dreaming that she would get married in. The problem was that the Atascadero Community Church belonged to the United Church of Christ. And the United Church of Christ is far to the left on any number of controversial issues. It is not, sadly, a Bible-centered, gospel-proclaiming church. So there we were on our wedding day, embarrassed and flustered by a rainbow. And perhaps you've had a similar experience. Maybe not on your wedding day, but you find yourself uncom uncomfortable or embarrassed or maybe even repulsed whenever you see a rainbow. You're anxious whenever you turn on the TV that the, there might be some commercial, some ad that you have to shield your children's eyes from. You, you scour through the, the movie reviews and then have to explain to your kids why they can't go see the new Buzz Lightyear movie. Or perhaps this coming 4th of July, you're just a little nervous about what's going to happen when they show up. Why do we have this problem? Well, the rainbow flag has become a symbol that is nothing like what it was originally intended to be. It's become a symbol for the immorality of man become a symbol for the tearing apart of basic definitions of marriage, of, of basic definitions of marriage relations between one man and one woman, uh, the, the tearing apart of identity as male and female. Those who made this flag have stolen God's purpose for the rainbow, and everyone who uses this flag, who raises it high, fails to realize that the rainbow is God's symbol. It is God's flag, a symbol of judgment, a symbol of mercy, and a symbol of salvation. It's God's symbol of rescue from the flood and rescue from a corrupted world. The rainbow belongs to God, and God tells us what it stands for, and God's people must take it back. God's people must know and proclaim the truth of God's rainbow. And th that is exactly what we're charged with doing uh, as we read and tell the whole story of the flood, of Genesis 8 and 9 and, and 6 through 9. Today we're going to examine the, the promises of God that are meant for us to know in the rainbow. Promises that fall into two realms. One of those realms are, are this world we live in today. The other is one that's yet to come. Uh, we're going to begin with the one we live in today. We'll begin by making this point, that we live in a new world under God's covenant rainbow. We live in a new world under God's covenant rainbow. Uh, the rainbow is, in fact, it's, it's the main point. It is the climax of the entire flood story. And we see God uh, declare it as much in ch chapter 9, verses 12 through 17, when he says this. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth when I bring clouds over the earth. 
and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. In case you didn't catch it, the rainbow is God's sign, God's symbol, God's flag in the sky. It, it's, it's his wonderful and repeated proclamation of a covenant that he has made, a promise that he will remember and he will never forget. He says it again, my covenant, my covenant, my covenant, I will remember. It's in fact more than a promise. It's a commitment and a new relationship that God has now with all mankind, with all creatures of the earth. It is for all future generations. It is an everlasting covenant. And God's covenant rainbow is meant to convey three things to mankind, mankind who now lives under it. The first is this. Under God's covenant rainbow, we are survivors. Under God's covenant rainbow, we are survivors. When we see that rainbow in the sky, we are reminded of, of two things that being survivors means from Genesis. The first is one we talked about last week, that we are reminded that we escaped a judgment we deserved. We escaped a judgment we deserve. We see evidence, evidence of this in our passage in verse 21 of chapter 8 when God says, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. In other words, God continues, even in the rainbow, to expose man's heart. This declaration is made of all mankind. It includes Noah. Noah did not escape the, the flood because he deserved to. Noah and his family and every generation to come after uh, is described in this verse. And all mankind is meant to look at the rainbow and see that the holy, undeserved nature of God's mercy in our very lives. We are survivors, not victors. And our survival is not proof of our goodness, it's proof of God's goodness to us. We also see evidence of this in the length of time that Noah and his family were in the ark. We, we read in chapter 8, verse 14, that it was on the second uh, month, on the 27th day of the month, that Noah went out of the ark. And earlier, uh, back in chapter uh, 7, verse 11, uh, a year earlier, we see that it was the second month, on the 17th day of the month, that the flood started. Now, there's a difference between the Jewish calendar, the way they, they record the year, and our solar calendar, but we could basically say that it, it, this was more than a year that the ark uh, lasted for Noah. It, it only rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but they were in that boat for something like 370 days. And most of those days were spent with the earth entirely or mostly covered in water. Noah and his family, they were rescued, and they are grateful, but they, they had to experience a year in a boat taking care of animals under the downpour of rain and being tossed around by the waves. Th this was no pleasure cruise. Th this was likely an experience that they had very few, if any, happy memories of, and perhaps every time it rained after this, Noah and his family experienced PTSD because it reminded them of a near-death experience that lasted a full year. It reminded them of the sin that was in mankind and that was still in their own hearts. It reminded them of the very real judgment of God. And that's what it's supposed to remind us. Now, we live in the valley and a downpour will probably never in any way be able to be described as a near-death experience for us, but it should be. God's covenant rainbow reminds us of his judgment. 
This is also why it is so horribly ironic and blasphemous for the LGBTQ crowd to use an image of the flood as their flag. They are foolishly and ignorantly referencing a story that is meant to convict them of the very sins they celebrate. They are defiantly flaunting their sinfulness while waving a flag that symbolizes their own judgment. They are declaring their allegiance, not with Noah and his family who were saved, but they're declaring their allegiance with the families and the civilization that was judged in the flood. And if not for the grace of God upon our hearts and minds this morning, we would be standing right along with them, planting our own flags of rebelliousness and sin in the ground. And our culture, unfortunately, has drowned out the true purpose of God's rainbow with this distorted message. One Sunday last year, I came to the church uh, early in the morning and noticed that our uh, children's bulletin board upstairs uh, had just been newly decorated. Uh, it was wonderful. It, it had uh, full of color and, and pictures and a message of the love of God, uh, full of little heart decals all over the, all over the board, and a, a message uh, of a passage of Scripture, something like John 3.16. But there was a, a, a little bit of a problem. Uh, the problem was that each of those hearts on the, on the board were colored with a full rainbow spectrum that looked uh, something like this. Although it's not a rainbow flag, I didn't want there to be any confusion about the position of our church, and I quickly uh, removed all the little tiny hearts from the children's bulletin board. I told Chris, our children's director, about this at our staff meeting that week, and knowing her well enough that that was not her intention whatsoever, and she said, I didn't even think of that. And that makes me angry. It's God's rainbow. I shouldn't have to take down a rainbow. And you better believe, Pastor Rick, I'm going to put something up there that makes unmistakable what God's rainbow is about. You watch. And this is exactly what we're charged to do as Christians. We, we take back God's rainbow by calling our culture to look up, to remember a message that God declares from above, a message that reminds them that we have survived a judgment we deserve a message of, of warning so that they might repent and turn to God. We also take back the rainbow by secondly pointing out that, that God has had mercy on us. Genesis 8 begins with these words, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him on the ark. This phrase, but God remembered, is, is just like earlier in chapter 6 when God said, uh, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Both of these passages mark the mercy and grace of God toward his people. That this was no covenant or, or salvation uh, or promise that Noah had earned. It was one God made, and he made it to demonstrate how merciful he is. Noah, his family, and the future generations of mankind our flood survivors because of God's mercy, and he wants us to see, even in the clouds of his judgment, the glory of his grace. We mentioned this last week, and we'll do so again. When God had favor on Noah and on his family, he had favor on you. You are part of Noah's family. The promise that he makes in Verses 21 and 22 of chapter 8 are ones he makes with your family and therefore with you. When God tells Noah and his family uh, to be fruitful and multiply, to live a full life in a world teeming with life, he calls the same to you. When God establishes a covenant with Noah, he establishes a covenant with you. And your life today is proof. Your, your very living and breathing is proof that God is merciful and that God has been merciful to you. So under God's covenant rainbow, we first remember that we are survivors. But God's covenant was about more 
much more than just allowing us to live. It's about much more than our survival. God's Noahic covenant rainbow gave us charge over a new world. Under God's rainbow, we are given charge of a new world. The beginning of chapter 9 again says this, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps in the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Be fruitful and multiply. Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. This is a, a significant restatement of the, the same kind of thing that God said to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1, to be fruitful and multiply, to have dominion over the earth. Mankind now is given a new world, a, a second chance at the same blessing. Mankind is, is renewed in his special position as stewards of God's earth, even though it was by man's hand that the earth was destroyed. But the fate of the world is given to the care of man once again. And this is a privileged position, a, a serious responsibility that all of us have as God's creatures, as those who stand above God's creatures. Uh, recently, we watched the new uh, Jurassic World movie. And even though the franchise has been fastly going downhill since the first Jurassic Park, it was all right. But there's some pretty frustrating uh, statements and messages being pushed even in this summer blockbuster that I think are a good illustration of our current culture's response to God. One of those is given, of course, by Ian Malcolm, and it's basically a repeat of a message that has been in place since the first movie where he says that human beings have no more right to safety or liberty than any other creature on this planet. We not only lack dominion over nature, we're subordinate to it. Now, this kind of a statement is a straight denial of the blessing of God that he declares to Noah and he declares to Adam. This is the kind of evolutionary thinking that says that we are really no more valuable than extinct dinosaurs. And when you follow the line of thinking through, you end up with many of the confused problems that we have in our day today. You see it in other messages that are also in this movie uh, that this movie uses to try to keep in step with the, the radical pushes that are happening in our culture. A culture that has changed very radically from when the first movie came out nearly 30 years ago, which is really hard for me to say. I don't know if anyone's in my same boat, but I, I still, it can't be 30 years. I, there's no way, but it has been. And in that span of time, we see a difference even in between these two movies. In the first movie, uh, there was a, a kind of reverence for manipulating the DNA, even of animals and even of extinct animals. And our movie today tries to play that, but then actually does a complete 180 on this concept, saying that, in fact, DNA manipulation, not just of dinosaurs, but of humans, is the next step in evolution. They present a main character whose mother had her through cloning without a father and was able to manipulate her DNA to ward off disease. And though some might think that's subtle, if you're paying attention, you recognize that this summer blockbuster of 2022, the summer blockbuster of 2022, is bringing in messaging from the lies of our culture's rainbow flag. Lies that say, well, maybe, maybe the traditional family of a mom and a dad is really no longer necessary. By the way, no one in the movie, nobody is even married. Uh, maybe our DNA, our biology, our maleness or femaleness can be uh, altered, changed, removed. Maybe boys can be girls and girls can be boys or something else entirely. Maybe dads can be moms and moms can be dads or some new kind of parent altogether. And this is where we are helped to look back at the text and notice that something is different about this new world and even about the position that God gives us in it when he restates the Genesis 1 blessing. 
In verse 2, God adds a phrase that was not in Genesis 1. He says, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. That doesn't sound good. That sounds like a world where the relationship between man and animal has changed or else where the contention, the, the hostility that already existed between man and the creatures he's supposed to steward is highlighted. And then God goes on to say, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. As I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. This is new. Apparently, God had only given man permission to be vegetarians in Genesis 1 and through to Genesis 4 and 5. But now mankind descended from Noah can eat meat. And if you're like me, you say, I'm glad I live in a post-flood world. Amen? But this new allowance and this new relationship between man and animals is also a reminder that we live in a world that is full of death. Our daily provision of food every day is a reminder that we live in a new world, but one that is still marred, one that is still suffering, one that is still in need of salvation. This world is not the final one. This world is still incomplete. But under God's covenant rainbow, we are given charge of a new world. Third, we also see that under God's covenant rainbow, we are reminded of the sanctity of life. Under God's covenant rainbow, we are reminded of the sanctity of life. In Genesis chapter 9, verses 4 through 6, after God says we can eat meat, he continues, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. These commands of God are focused on the inherent value of life, both of animals and of mankind. And we might think that the flood demonstrates that God doesn't care very much about man or animals at all. We might think that God doesn't think very much of us or, or he's just looking for a reason to get us. That's the God of the Bible. Look what he did in the flood. But on the contrary, these commands demonstrate that God holds both animal life and human life in a, a far more sacred and special and significant way than any of us do. In the case of animals, God does not allow man to eat or treat them however he wants. Their blood is now to be a symbol of their life, a life that they have from God and not from us. We are not permitted to eat meat with its blood still in it. Now, this is different, thank God, from eating rare meat, of which I enjoy very much. It's something more like eating, you know, blood sausage that's not cooked very well, or eating meat from an animal that has not been drained of its blood. Now, we really don't encounter this as an option at our grocery store, so don't worry too much about your lunch today. Uh, but the point is this. The creation is God's, and it is not ours. We are only stewards. We cannot do what we please. And we acknowledge our creator in all of life and in this specific way that we, we obey God's command and we remember life comes from God, not from us. Now in the case of humans, God demonstrates that in all of his creation, he holds humanity in the highest esteem. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Th this is another restatement, a reminder that God's original creation holds true. Man is still made in God's image. Uh, and in week one of this series, we looked at both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and saw how God makes man more special than anything else he has created in any place. So, so I can say again that 
to God, you are the most important, you are the most significant thing he created. You are more significant than plants and trees, than, than bugs and birds, than cats and dogs, than the climate and the environment, than tyrannosauruses and pterodactyls, than an entire universe of stars and of planets. Man and man alone is the pinnacle of God's creation, and not just God's creation in the earth. And God cares for nothing, nothing in all the universe, more than he cares for you. And we are charged to do the same. This is the view of mankind we are to have. This is why the news this week of overturning Roe v. Wade was, was so special. Not because Roe was a bad judicial decision, not, not because it was improper jurisprudence, not because it, it did not uphold the U.S. Constitution, but because it did not uphold the sanctity of life. Because it was an attack, it was an assault, it was an insurrection against the sacred value and position of man given by God. We still live in California. Amen? Yeah, we've got a couple. Where attempts are, are already being made, have been made, to further the access and ease of murdering babies who are sacred to God. So, it's hard to celebrate when you live in the land of Oz. But what this does mean for the rest of our country for turning the tide of, of 50 years nearly and the saving of many babies we know will result in other states. It, it should make us want to, to sing aloud in the land of Oz to join the, the lollipop guild and to say, ding dong, Roe is dead. But of course, this also means that we need to continue to value the lives of children, of families, of the elderly, of, of every person that we meet, even the ones we don't like so much, the ones that are running away from the Lord, the ones that are, are ruining their lives, destroying their lives and the lives of others in their sin. We want them to know these truths. We want them to look at the rainbow and to know they are valued by God. They have been saved by God. They are under the grace of God. And this leads us to our final point. But first, let us, let us review. We live, all of us, in a new world under God's covenant rainbow. And th this means that we are survivors. We are survivors of God's judgment, and we are survivors by his mercy and grace. We are also a people who are given a charge, a charge of, of a new world, world God wants us to live and enjoy full of life. And we're reminded how, how precious that life is to God. Every time we look at the rainbow, these are the things God wants us to remember and to commit to. But this new world it is not the last world. God's covenant rainbow looks beyond Noah, it looks to a better world. It looks to a promise God also makes to us in the scriptures that we will live in the world to come and we will do so by God's covenant sacrifice. We will live in the world to come by God's covenant sacrifice. And we see this in our text. In chapter 8, after Noah comes out of the ark, the very first thing he did was to worship God. And the way he worshiped is, is instructive for the rest of the Bible. He, he made a sacrifice, a burnt offering. This was a, a grateful act of worship, a grateful act of, of acknowledging the Lord and saying thank you. It, it was putting the Lord first in his life and the worship of the Lord first and, and this is an important lesson for all of us. But it's also an acknowledgement that Noah needed 
a sacrifice. Noah was still a guilty man. He was still alive in a sinful world. He was only surviving that flood because of God's mercy. And even when God is pleased with Noah's sacrifice and he he figuratively smells the sweet aroma of it, he does restate the sinfulness of man. Mankind needs God's grace and mercy still. We are still sinners in need of saving. And the final story of Genesis 9 is another reminder of it. It's perhaps a bit of an odd story after such a wonderful rescue and deliverance in the flood, a story that makes us think as we looked last week about all the cute little pictures of animals smiling and playing and green fields and the rest. But that's not how this story ends. We see in this final story four ways that we're reminded of this truth that we see in the sacrifice. First, Noah, who was this righteous man, blameless in his generation, is now shamefully drunk and naked and exposed. Second, his son Ham, in in an honor culture, disgraces and shames his father and does so publicly. Now, some tried to make more of what's going on in this passage, but we don't want to read into the text something that's not there. Ham simply disgraced his father, and it probably says more about our honorless and disgraceful culture uh, that we find this action of Ham no big deal than it does their culture. Third, Ham's son, Canaan, is cursed by Noah. In both of these two, the second and the third, we see the breakdown of the first family, after the flood. And know this curse of Canaan has nothing at all to do with the color of Canaan's skin, nor is it a curse on Canaan's people. This text has has been shamefully used by some to support slavery, but simply put, this curse only applies to Canaan, and his name is repeated. And the fourth and the final reminder that something more is needed is the death of Noah himself. This place is still a place plagued by death. This place is still a place under the curse of God's judgment for the sin of Adam and Eve. And this sad conclusion of Noah's story ought to remind us of another promise. A promise that is far greater than the one made in God's covenant rainbow, but one that is kept alive by it. A promise that is God's first promise that someone would come who would crush the serpent's head. Someone would come who would undo everything that he destroyed. But accomplishing that feat would require a sacrifice of himself. This promise is the expectation of every story in all the Bible, and we see it repeated in the very next story, when God sacrifices an animal and clothes Adam and Eve before they leave the garden. We see it when uh, Abel brings a more acceptable offering in his sacrifice of the firstborn of his flock. We see it here when Noah makes a sacrificial offering and the Lord accepts it. We see it finally and fully when the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, He has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The salvation of Noah The continuation of man is about much more than than keeping the human race alive. It's about bringing the salvation of Christ and keeping that promise alive. It's about the culmination of all of God's promises for your benefit. And this makes God's covenant rainbow 
a beautiful reminder of the gospel. The, the rainbow is a symbol of the gospel. It's a symbol of salvation. It's a symbol of God's unmerited, free grace fulfilled in Christ. A grace which is greater than man's sinfulness. A grace which conquers our rebellion, which, which gives uh, new life. A new life through sacrifice. Sacrifice on a cross that fully pays for all of our sin. A reminder of a world to come where, where man would dwell with God again. This is why it is so maddening and pitiful when mankind makes the rainbow a symbol of anything less than this. Anything less than the gospel of Christ. When, when they are meant to see the salvation of God and instead use it to deny him when they are meant to see the love of God and instead use it to boast of their own self-love, when they are meant to see the gospel of Jesus Christ who would suffer and die for their sins and instead see only themselves and do not call out to Jesus, but not you, not you, not me, if you hear the sound of my voice this morning, if you hear the Lord calling to your heart through these words in Genesis, if you feel the clear conviction of the Holy Spirit, call out to Jesus. Call out to Jesus. Don't let the world tell you what the rainbow means. Don't let your own heart twist the glorious truth of God. Let God's rainbow be a celebration with belief in, in God's glorious promises and not a mocking of our God. About four years ago in March 2018, uh, we were over at my brother-in-law's uh, house. He was at the time living in Hanford and a storm had just rushed in uh, through the area. And we went outside after the storm and noticed this I incredible, beautiful rainbow across the sky, even, even more vivid and bright than you see there, and it was actually a double rainbow. So we got, we got the, the girls, Emma, who at the time was only six years old, Constance, who was only three, uh, to, to come out and, and look at this rainbow. And they, they'd seen rainbows before, but maybe just a little glimpse out the car window or something like that. This was really the first time they had seen a real rainbow, and, and they were they were overcome. They couldn't, they couldn't express their excitement enough. They, they were just teeming with joy and happiness and giggling and, and pointing at this rainbow. <laughs> and we asked them, because they knew, what, what does that mean? What does God's rainbow mean? And they told us it means God will never flood the world again. That is the response God wants all of us to have at the rainbow. To look up and, and not to have anxiety about it, not to have embarrassment about it, not to be uncomfortable by it, not, not to be ashamed, but to look up and say, what a glorious God. What a good God to me. What a good Savior I have in Jesus Christ. And to want to get other people involved, to want to say, hey, look, look at this rainbow. Do you know what that means? Do you know what God is saying to you right now? He has, he has put his sign, his flag in the sky. He's shouting out that you might be saved. And that you might dance like my little girls. Would you pray with me? Father God, we, we are overcome. Overcome, first of all, because, Lord, we, we don't want to admit that we are sinners. We don't want to admit that there's something fundamentally wrong with us and with this world we live in. But Lord, we, we cannot escape it. 
and it is far more serious than, than we can even know. Forgive me for passing by when I see a rainbow. When I read your word and just go through the motions and don't take it to heart. When I hear you shouting to me of your salvation and I've spurned it. But Lord Jesus Christ, I, I see now. I see again. And I believe what you tell me. I believe you came in the flesh. You died on the cross. You rose from the grave. That I might know my sins are forgiven completely. And I have not life in a new world now, but life in an eternal world that you will bring when you come. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. And would you fill my heart with joy for your salvation. It is in the glorious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Please stand as the worship team leads us in one final song this morning. Before I give the benediction, just a reminder that we are having our family fun day right after the service in our fellowship hall with lots of food and, and fun, and I uh, invite you to share in that together. For the benediction this morning, I, I thought to put together something of a benediction that God gives to Noah here, a mixture of things, uh, with a conclusion from Aaron's blessing. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I've set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. 
When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. And you, be fruitful and multiply. Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 